Hi guys. Hi. I think we're going live. Looks like you're here. Looks like I'm here. We are just waiting for SenRev to join. My friend Coral Chung is joining us. She's the CEO of SenRev, which is the next generation of luxury handbag company. Hi, Coral. Hello. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Such a huge response from me because I can't believe this worked so easily. I mean, knock on wood. I can't believe this worked. Hi. <laughs> Hi. It's so great to see you. You look gorgeous. Always. Um, this is so cool. So now we have all these comments coming to me coming across your face. And it yes. looks like people from Mexico, <laughs> Brazil, and Ireland. Oh my gosh. I know. Amazing. I see the Brazilian flag. That's so awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to stay a little bit towards the uh, side of the screen where there's not so many comments, but yeah, amazing. It's so great to see you. Are you in California right now? Yes, yes. Are you? Or are you in Wyoming? I'm actually in Utah. Utah. <laughs> it's, it's technically spring break right now, and so I'm trying to do a little bit of spring break, um, but it's, it's a raining outside, so perfect for a perfect day to stay indoors <laughs> but uh, as you know um aria is super active my daughter so she um she went rock climbing today so hopefully they didn't caught up and get caught up in the storm so we'll see what happened <laughs> oh wow like with the whole like the harness and the whole oh, oh yeah 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 she's she's really hardcore um she does all the cliffs and you know what they call five eight five nines yeah she's pretty hardcore for an eight-year-old so she's fearless. She's, she's, yeah, she is definitely fearless, not afraid of heights and taking risks and um, embrace the natural life. And so she really loves it. It's, it's super, it's become like a core part of her. Well, a lot of people from That's Brazil, cool. some Italians, that's exciting. Hello from really Brazil. Oh. Hello, Brazil. So um, I wanted to first tell everybody about, or have you tell everybody about you. I'm really excited to talk about um, some of the things I know about you, which is like the interesting uh, career path you've taken and how you got into becoming a CEO of a luxury handbag company. And um, because you started in finance, right? Yes. The, my first internship ever was in investment banking. <laughs> it was a very, um, it was a very uh, interesting experience in the sense that it made me realize that that was not the career that I wanted to pursue. Although I have a lot of very successful friends in that field, um, it was not for me. And I'm glad I realized that. I mean. Actually, I'm curious, you know, what what was it that got you into acting? How did you know that that was going to be your path? I think, um, you know, it's it, <laughs> unlike investment banking or being a CEO of a luxury brand, like in sixth grade, you can be super into it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, was in my, I think I was in my first play in sixth grade, and then I was in all the plays thereafter. And when it got, got time in college... I went to a liberal arts school. I was an English major. Mm -hmm. I loved school. Yeah. And um, but then I just kind of accidentally was having a theater major at the same time because it was nice. what I loved the most and the people that I loved to hang out with. And then um, I didn't really know anybody who had ever been an actor. So I was afraid to admit that I wanted to be an actor. Because mm. I didn't understand that as a career path. I didn't know none of my parents' friends were actors or anything like right. that. Um, so my way to it was all through study. Mm -hmm. I went to London for a junior year abroad. I spent the yeah. summer in Oxford learning to act, and then, um, and then I decided to go to graduate school, and that helped me be surrounded by people who were going to do this for a living and new people who were going to do it for a living, and they also teed you up and helped you find your way to an agent and understand that kind of thing. So yeah, the so mine was just directly through an academic. Um, path. And I think what happened in college it, is that it's the nerdy way. <laughs> what, the nerdy way. I like the nerdy way. But acting. I love it. <laughs> I couldn't think of anything else. Like I started to panic on those career days, like sophomore year in college. Like, 
<laughs> I don't want to go to any, like, I'm not interested. I knew I wasn't interested in doing anything else. And I think that's kind of key with a career in the arts is, I always say, like, something you did say to me, is there anything else you can do? Yeah, it's, it's, it, I think it's, I think it's with anything um, you're passionate about, you know, when you're truly pursuing your passion. So that, I think that makes a lot of sense because for me, you know, investment banking or finance was sort of a known career path. You know, a lot of firms recruited from the, you know, schools and uh, it, it seemed like what everybody was doing. It was seemed prestigious and it seemed like, um, something that you can pursue to to get you know financial confidence and all of this um but yeah i quickly realized that that was not my passion you know and actually kind of like you i i really discovered entrepreneurship very young in life um although i did my sh fair share of school plays i just never <laughs> never thought that i would pursue it professionally but um yeah you know I, it was it was very early on where uh, my parents were both uh, engineers and uh, my mom was a chemistry professor and they uh, studied in the U.S. for graduate school from China um, and then uh, they became entrepreneurs and so as an only child I went through that very authentic experience with them uh, so you know I just always tried to pursue different things related to starting the quintessential lemonade stand right as a kid um, and so I always kind of told myself, and this, you know, may or may not have to do with being a woman and kind of more um, practical in that sense, right? I always told myself, oh, I needed a certain amount of experience, like I needed to work in finance and work in consulting and work at a couple of successful companies before I could start my own. Um, so that, that was always in the back of my mind, but I gave myself a lot of excuses, I would say, in terms of, you know, oh, I need to get one more experience under my belt, or I'm not quite ready yet. Um, so it, it was really interesting when I finally took the plunge for SenRev. And actually, I think you and I met before I started SenRev. I want to so it, it was right kind of about it. Yeah. But so when you, so that moment when you decided you were going to leave your job in investment banking, so how, how do you do that? Like in terms of, that's incredibly brave to recognize that. I mean, did, were you kind of doing the two things at the same time? Like, did you hold on to your job a little bit? And then, you know what I mean? Were you, how, how did you do it? Or did you just go, I'm going to give notice and I'm going to move on to this other thing? What, I'm, how, does, I'm how do you leave? I'm way too practical and analytical to do that. You know, I wish I could have that, you know, Jerry Maguire moment, right? Where I write this manifesto and I'm like, peace guys. But I, it wasn't, it wasn't that dramatic. It was very thoughtful and measured. Uh, I was at the time right before starting SenRev, um, I think right around when you and I met for the first time, um, I was at this uh, big data analytics company, a tech company called Medallia, which later went on to have a super successful IPO and I was leading retail there. So it was a really great, it was a great situation to be in. It was a high flying, as they call it, unicorn company. And I was um, really loving it, you know, certainly better than uh, my previous experiences in finance or consulting, but I really also felt like, you know, something was still missing and I, it was the t right time for me to start my own company. Um, so I took about six months to your point of overlap, night and weekend work, really fleshing out the idea for SenRev, making sure that uh, a large enough market exists, validating the business model, speaking to a lot of women, actually like yourself, right? I think back in the day, I remember when we got coffee, I was asking you a lot about what you thought was missing in the handbag category, what you felt like um, you've kind of explored or collaborated with, um, and what you felt like, you know, de design-wise, feature-wise, price point wise, what would make sense. Um, so I had a lot of those types of conversations and well, did a lot. Didn't you also have moments at when you were working in finance that your options for like your briefcase, I remember you being like these, the options that I had for work in the space that I was in and I needed my laptop and I needed, you know, files or whatever. It, they just weren't cute. Like yeah. you saw that 
Yes, it was, it was exactly, it was, you know, um, and I think this is why I say Donna or Suits was such a inspirational show because, you know, the women portrayed on that show were strong, beautiful, intelligent, super stylish, right? And had a lot of that elegance that the center of woman embraces. Um, and I think what I struggled with was exactly what you said. You know, I was forced to use this really ugly, masculine, bulky laptop bag to haul my computer and uh, my documents around and my pitch decks and, you know, all this uh, stuff and it was not representative of me as a woman or as somebody who um, emotionally connects with products that I wear, right? Or I want to have that product represent my sense of style or my identity in a way. Um, and it was just this, you know, thing that was bulky and terrible. Um, but at the same time, I couldn't use, you know, the other luxury bags because it was, um, it was really, it was not, you know, it was not made to carry a laptop. It was not made for me traveling all the time. It was just not made for um, these types of uses. And so it was really uh, that point of inspiration where I felt like, gosh, there is an opportunity here to create something that's really new and different. Uh, and for this woman, you know, like, like a Donna, right? Or like a Coral or Sarah, who is, you know, a young mom traveling all the time, needing to carry her life in her bag, but also wanting something that looks beautiful and is really stylish and elegant and high quality. Yes, and can go, you know, day to night. I'm not, I don't want to always switch out my purses. Yes. You know, yeah. So when you created the company, you did, I do want to dip quickly into the sustainability component because um, I noticed yesterday in the comments on my post that people are very, very interested in that. And we've talked about it a lot about how that was one of the pillars of your company when you were putting it together was the the idea of sustainability and sustainability in the luxury space. And um, and I had a, people were asking if you have vegan options. They were asking how how you do that in luxury. Was it, are you an innovator in that? place you know or do, does do you have mentors or inspiration of people doing moving the needle in terms of sustainability and luxury it's a really exciting movement i think that's happening in luxury and in fashion overall that we are really at the forefront of i think one of the benefits of starting a company and a brand from scratch is you could really focus on the things that are important and different from how things were done in the past uh, so I'll give you just like a few examples. So one is um, in the traditional luxury industry, uh, there are a lot of these practices that are very outdated, very damaging to the environment. Um, one of them is they actually, you know, at the end of the season or end of the year, they'll destroy their products and they'll, you know, actually burn it. Uh, which is obviously a, a terrible practice. Uh, and so one of the things that we really innovated on is we, A, never overproduce. So we would rather sell out or um, have a pre-order model rather than produce excess inventory. Um, and the second piece is we do a big um, campaign every year can, called Handbag Revival, which we've actually just launched today. And it's all about giving value back to the consumer for bags that are gently handled so we don't have to destroy it. It's really um, perfect product, really. And it's almost you can't see any flaws with a naked eye, but maybe it was used for a photo shoot or it was used in a showroom. Um, etc. And so we don't have to discard or destroy any products. And I think it's really, uh, it's really important to be able to say to our community that we are as much as possible focused on being completely zero waste. Um, and we use a lot of our um, byproducts for small other goods. We really try as much as possible to reduce uh, waste throughout our entire supply chain. Amazing. And you t you told me the last time we spoke on the phone that you are working towards a vegan. There was something made of cactus. Am I right? Am I allowed to? Talk Ooh, okay, so so now we're venturing into the future, which is so exciting. So we have launched um, vegan 
bags. Uh, so if you check out our website right now, we do have a section with uh, vegan products in some of our most popular styles, like the Aria belt bag or the uh, Maestro family. Um, but we're always constantly exploring different plant-based materials, different sustainable materials. And a lot of these uh, materials are not quite commercially ready and we don't want to sacrifice the beauty and the hand feel and the durability and the quality of the bag either. So uh, it's really quite rigorous in terms of all of the research and development that we've put into this. And so we have found a material that we're excited about. It is going to come in the summer um, and it may or may not be made from cactus, which is really exciting because um, the, the plant itself doesn't actually have to get destroyed, it actually regenerates. And obviously, um, growing the cactus captures carbon from the air. And so there's a really great story from a sustainability perspective in using that material. So that's something that's in the works, which we're very excited and proud about. So hopefully, hopefully it'll be official soon. Oh, that's exciting. It's I, I didn't it's spill very beans. sneak preview of it. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry if I spill beans. No, oh, no. I we're apologize. I, I just, I think like the nerdy aspect must be super fun for you guys to talk about, like actually how you do it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's quite technical. And um, like I said, it requires a lot of experimentation. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very interesting because the products that we make are all three dimensional, right? And so to translate that uh, two dimensional design into a three dimensional prototype, uh, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of development. So our current vegan collection took about a year um, to perfect. And uh, before I launched Senrev, actually, we did about a year and a half of development work in terms of finding the right partner in Italy to work with. Um, it, it's quite it's quite a technical process, uh, but I really enjoy it. I, I think it's extremely fulfilling and it's really rewarding to see how passionate um, the artisans that work on the products are, the, how much pride they take. Mm -hmm. And so, again, it makes me feel you know, it's quite upsetting to to uh, see the, the, the workmanship and how amazing it is, you know, be put into a product and then later destroyed, right? right. Um, I think that's just a, such a terrible practice. So uh, every year, you know, we want to shine a light on that and again, kind of emphasize that we are able to do it differently as a new brand. Um, and Handbag Revival is really about not only um, shining a light on this and educating people about these negative practices, but really helping push the industry forward um, and just showcasing that there are other ways to, to um, create a business and create product and not destroy the environment. And, you know, as much as possible, try to improve and use more sustainable practices. And how long does your event last? So, so for people who are interested in, in getting a revived handbag, well, it's, um, <laughs> well, that's the issues that we're always grappling with. So we've done this, this is our third year, and it always sells out. <laughs> so we try to make it last, for two, but usually it sells out in the first couple of days. Um, so it is a very popular and um, high demand type of situation because we have fairly limited inventory, as I mentioned, because, you know, we don't ever want to overproduce. Uh, so yeah, it's you know it usually ends up lasting for a few days because of how quickly things go, um, but we're we're trying to make it uh, so that people have a chance to get it you know over the course of the next week or so. I had some really interesting questions um, left on my post yesterday. Um, yeah, awesome for you. Really intelligent questions, exactly. Oh. It's so great. I, it's so great. Thank you. If anybody is here who left a question, thank you so much. And thank you for your comments. And I do look at them. I do, I do, I do, I do, I do. Um, so, so someone asked, what is your, what is Senrev's main inspiration in terms of design? Uh, it's really actually the combination of sense and dream, right? That's what Senrev stands for. Uh, and it's this idea that a multifaceted woman 
doesn't shouldn't have to make sacrifices or compromises between the fantasy and the everyday between something that is practical and sensible with something that's dreamlike and 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 fantasy um and so really that's the foundation for our philosophy around product creation uh it's it, the company itself uh the brand itself is really focused on this woman, her wants and needs, her evolving lifestyle. And I think part of the way that we've been able to succeed from the beginning until now, even though there have been a lot of different challenges, you know, whether it's the pandemic or um, some of the macro uncertainty, uh, it's because we have a deep connection with who this woman is. It's very authentic to our team. Everyone on our team really embraces this and understands this. And we're in constant dialogue with our community. Um, and so uh, one of the um, inspirations for the vegan collection was actually coming from the community where we saw more and more women in the vegan lifestyle, you know, in the food that they eat or what they want to wear. And so we felt like it was really important um, part of our brand to be able to offer that option um, to women who had this preference. Uh, so really that's, that's the root of the inspiration. Amazing. And so you did mention like with the the, the uncertainty um, of the pandemic, somebody did ask how that has affected your business this year being in the luxury space. It's been challenging uh, from a couple of different fronts. Uh, if you remember last year, and actually now, you know, Europe is being hit really hard with the pandemic. But last year around this time, it was really, really tough in Italy, uh, where the entire, you know, supply chain, our, our main manufacturing is in Italy, um, and it shut down. Uh, quite suddenly, and um, there was quite a lot of uncertainty around when they would reopen, you know, we would get status updates, but it was really unclear, um, and uh, they ended up being closed for about two and a half months, fully shut down, and even when they reopened, it was, you know, socially distant, a slow ramp up, and so the production output declined quite a bit, so one of the biggest challenges was we really were really behind on inventory, we were quite sold out. And so it really required a lot of understanding from our community that, you know, they would wait a little bit longer for their products and so forth. Um, so that was quite a challenge. I think one of the other challenges though, um, ended up being quite an exciting opportunity for us is we really looked at how different parts of the world were being affected by the pandemic and you know, certain certain places were recovering uh, faster than others in the sense that they were able to contain the pandemic, right? And so people still could safely uh, go outdoors or shop or do small gatherings, etc. Um, so we really started emphasizing our global expansion. Um, Senrev, I think, has in the last year become much more global of a brand um, than in the prior year. So that was a big change as well. Um, and then the other challenge, of course, is um, managing and working with a team that's remote and there's so many new people that um, haven't met each other or I haven't met in person and you know we have a, a virtual relationship, which I think is is really interesting. I think that is going to change how people work together going forward, you know, in terms of there are a lot of companies that are doing remote permanently, and there's a lot of um, discussion around that for us internally as well. We also have such a global team. Uh, we have folks um, based in Italy, of course, where we manufacture and design and do our material sourcing, etc. Um, we also have folks out in Asia, in Hong Kong and Shanghai, and then all over the US in New York, California, um, Pennsylvania, uh, Colorado. So um, it's a very spread out team. And I think uh, it's really hard to make sure that people feel like they're still building relationships and they have bonds and um, we're still building a strong culture. Amazing. I mean, I just get exhausted when I think about um, the time differences when you need to have meetings with those different places. <laughs> Yes, it's a lot of Madonna in your life that makes it all work. <laughs> oh my gosh, um, I wish you know. 
everybody wants a Donna in their lives. I mean, I actually, it's uh, it's funny because my husband and I will always talk about like, oh, I wish we could have a Donna. Or whenever something really amazing happens, you know, where the timing is perfect and it just like works out right. We're like, oh man, this is like a Donna moment, you know? I know it was fantasy. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Uh, <laughs> But yes, I do. I do have. Uh, I do have someone um, who helps me out a little bit with all of this coordination. And I will say that um, um, I have an amazing team, which is uh, one of the most rewarding things about building a company and being a CEO is to is to put together a team that really represents the values and the culture of the company, and also just people who enjoy being together and working together. I think that's so amazing, right? Because yeah. then um, it makes you know any work that you do a lot more fun and I, I think we all see it with like the suits group right like you guys just all love working together so much uh and that makes all the different challenges you know and i think the challenges are very uh they're just the levels um and so in order to really break through as a woman who is leading a company um especially from the beginning uh i would say it, 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 the odds are stacked against you. So that that is the reality of the challenge. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I feel like I've generally been fortunate in that I've had a lot of wonderful mentors, a great community and support system, which super which is super helpful, you know, men and women um, who are on my board, who have been longtime advisors for me. Um, but once in a while, you know, there are things that happen that really piss, that piss me off. <laughs> you yeah, you can say that on it's, it's, and it's, you know, and I have to say like the, the sexism really still exists, unfortunately. And once in a while, I'm reminded of that, which really pisses me off. And, uh, you know, just to just something that really happened recently i won't mention names because uh to me i feel like this person should be really embarrassed as to what happened but we were having a you know zoom business meeting right and this actually reminded me of that episode of suits you know when donna had that investor meeting um and and it was like such a it was like such an awful rejection right where they really were so demeaning to her and they rejected her and they kind of put her down, you know, put her in her place. Um, so this was a situation where it was, it was so strange. And honestly, afterwards, I was so pissed off. Um, but there was a male investor who he just, in, in my mind, just went off the rails. You know, he's just started talking about how he doesn't understand uh, female oriented products. And so you know, in order to better understand it, he needs to ask his wife and his mistress and his girlfriends. And it, he went off the rails. And uh, the whole time I was just nodding and trying to be polite. But in my head, I'm thinking, why Why are you bragging to me that you have mistresses and girlfriends in a serious business meeting? Um, and I won't even get into how, how much worse it got, you know. <laughs> As oh, I want you to. <laughs> <laughs> Until I finally had to cut it off. But it was so ridiculous. And... And I was just thinking, like, is what was going on? Is this, you know, 1985 or something? <laughs> like, what, why do you think that it's appropriate to speak to a female entrepreneur and executive like this? Um, it's totally inappropriate, you know? And I think what really uh, struck me was that he was brazenly behaving this way, as if it was totally normal, you know? That it was abnormal for me to get offended. Um, and that was very upsetting. I, I have to say I was really pissed off. So things like that do still happen, I would say. And and to be honest, that would never happen to a man. It just wouldn't, you know. And and I think that's really upsetting to me as well. Um, so I think, yes, there are a lot of challenges. But to me, the way that I try to think about overcoming some of these challenges is I always try to be as prepared as possible, you know, really understand the quantitative side of things, understand the metrics, understand um, what are the drivers uh, that will get an investor excited, for example, or what are the 
elements that will allow a partner to take us on um, and work with us. Um, and also, I think it's really important to be able to be authentic still. You know, at the end of the day, this person that I just talked about, I mean, we're not going to work together. You know, no way, no way. And I think it's about not compromising on some of your core values and principles and not feeling like you're backed into a corner and you have to do something because I think that always uh, that always puts you and the company and just puts things in a really tough situation, right? Yeah. Um, and so it's about finding people who really understand the vision um, and support you and really believe, you know, they're the believers, right? And really aligning yourself with those people. Um, and there's always haters out there. You know, I would say that's true for, for men and women. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just about trying to, you know, debunk or move on with the haters. I think that's that's one of the biggest um, hurdles and not taking it super personally. Yeah. Um, although that's hard, you know, because when you start something, especially a brand like Samrab that's so personal and is, you know, you put your heart and soul into it, uh, it's really hard to have that separation for sure. Yes. Yes. I get it. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's just like you know you are so invested in all the characters that you play you know right. like they, they just like become part of you in a way too well um you know since since we've taken a bit of a, a serious tone and we don't have to stay here we can stay here as long or as little as you want i just wanted to bring up something that you and i have talked about personally yes. um and I think like everybody in the world or especially in the US and Canada and, and you know, near where we live um, are struggling to understand hatred as a whole. Mm -hmm. we, we have been spending some time um, on that topic. And I guess I wanted to know what I can do, what we can do to support the work that you are doing to make a difference in the Asian community. Um, I don't really want to dredge, you know, ask you to dredge up any pain that you've been feeling lately. Um, but I just want to acknowledge it and and ask how me and the people that have joined us today can support and, and maybe how you are addressing it with your team. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, this did take a turn to become a lot more serious, but I think it's a really important topic and I'm glad you brought it up. And it's something that I feel very passionate about. Um, and actually, it's exactly like you said, in a way to me, uh, it's important to shine a light on the topic. You know, it's really, really important to create awareness because one of the things that I really realized is everyone lives in their little bubbles, you know, and um, it requires influential people in their bubbles that they respect um, and have appreciation for to bring up topics that are uncomfortable or are, um, are relevant and important, right? And so one of the things that we did as a team was, um, you know, I sent a personal letter and email to all of our SENRAV community and uh, the response that we got was incredible. And there were so many people who said, wow, I'm so glad you sent this letter out. And the letter was, the content of it was very, it was more focused on informing, educating, and again, you know, shining a light, like, hey, just so you are aware, these are the things that are happening, right? And we wanted to make sure that our educated, smart, you know, super intelligent, savvy SENRAV community was aware of this. Um, and, you know, the response that I got, one really stood out and she basically said, look, I live uh, I'm a white woman in the middle of America. This letter was so important that you sent it. I had no idea any of this was happening. Um, and I'm so appreciative that you gave me this information so I could stay informed. Yeah. You know, I think that's so powerful because uh, it's true, right? When you, when you, when you 
are, are in this bubble, whether it's because of um, social media or because of the community that you live in, oftentimes you're just not aware of other things that are happening. Um, and so to me, that's one of the most important things, right? Um, I think the second most important thing is not just have awareness, but really have certain things like occupy your mind share in an authentic way, right? Meaning like it becomes part of your natural dialogue, whether it's a dinner time conversation or it's a conversation with your kids or it's, um, you know, it's not something that's kind of just happening in passing, right? You integrate it into your life a little bit because you're thinking about it and you're bothered by it or you're struck by it or there's something about how <clears throat> extreme things have gotten that, you know, it's a tipping point and you 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 want to have discussions with friends about it, your family, et cetera. Um, so that I feel like is really important, right? It's like that, it's a small group intimate conversations where this topic needs to rise to the top, you know? Um, and then of course, if you have, uh, are financially capable, I think this effort, um, is really underfunded, honestly. There's so much, you know, legislation that can be improved. Um, there's so there's just so much, you know, on the grassroots level, community level, um, but also, uh, you know, more broadly, like at the federal government level. Um, so, you know, any type of contribution or any type of um, um, kind of uh, commitment to volunteering and things like that could be extremely helpful. Um, you know, whether it's participating in some of the marches that are happening um, around the U.S. or um, really, again, just reaching out to your local government officials. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that can be um, done, again, with, you know, after being informed and having it occupy your mind share. So I would say those are kind of the three things that would be extremely helpful. And even for me, you know, I always feel like I'm not doing enough. I feel like, gosh, you know, um, as as an Asian entrepreneur and, and a female who is, um, you know, this is so authentic to who I am. I could always be doing more. Uh, but I do think like these are three things that are, they're not too overwhelming to take on, you know, for any of it. I love that term. I'm going to borrow it, occupy the mind share. <laughs> that's, a, that's new to me. Um, probably everybody it's just another way of saying, like, I'm thinking about it, you know, and it's kind of like what you're doing, right? Reaching out to friends and reaching out to people, checking in with them, having a conversation. Um, and then as you do, you, you your opinion becomes more fully formed, right? And I recently had a conversation with a friend of mine from San Francisco who he's, he's super cool. You know, I, I really love him. Um, but he actually uh, was, you know, he, he basically was like, look, I didn't, I didn't feel like in the beginning it was a huge deal um, to call COVID, you know, the China virus or it's, he's like, oh, it's just like the Spanish flu, right? Like, can you explain to me why it's a big deal? Um, and so we had a very productive conversation about that. And, uh, you know, he was like, oh, okay, it's really helpful to hear that perspective. Well, having that curiosity, the courage yes. to ask, yes. and an open mind and heart to hear an answer that may be different than what you anticipated, exactly. they're all, um, those are all great things. Exactly. Um, exactly. But, but you're right, the conversations. The conversations need to keep happening. The conversations right. need to keep happening. We can't cancel conversations. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. And I think um, it's okay to have, you know, I, I would say that I'm very... Um, uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, you know, I think it's okay if there's some disagreement, right? Or if there's some things that, uh, you know, some people maybe even strongly disagree with, right? And I, but it's to your point, having that curiosity and the open mind and actually not suppressing that, right? Because I think that's the worst part, right? When you feel like you can't actually have an open discussion about it because you're embarrassed or maybe it's against some of the popular views. Um, and so if that's the case, you never really get to evolve from that point. Yeah. So who, so taking another turn, uh, another hard turn, who um, you, you were asked, who is your um, fashion, like your, 
favorite fashion icon? Ooh. Oh, it's so hard to pick just one. I mean, I have to say Donna. Donna is a great one. I mean, all the suits ladies, right? Jessica. Don, I mean, Don. I yeah. Um, uh, I have to say that uh, you know, when we started Senrev, there were a couple of people that we really felt like were kind of timeless and iconic who represented the Sunrev woman. And one of them was Audrey Hepburn. And we just felt like, you know, she was really had that amazing quality where even today, you know, her elegance, her beauty, her style uh, was extremely, is still extremely relevant, you know? And then um, that's something that we aspire towards for Sunrev is that it has that longevity and that timelessness and that universal elegance. Um, so yeah, she was one of the original. That's so funny because she's definitely one of mine. And and I think it's that timelessness. And I think about like with my Senrev bags and which, you know, I have multiple. <laughs> and many colors, many in stars. terms of actually, this is related to the idea of sustainability, everything Everything I buy now, I mean, not the, not the sweatpants that I'm wearing underneath the frame right now, <laughs> not that kind of thing, not the sneakers that I'm wearing, but, um, but other purchases, um, I do, I think about them as time capsules, like something to pass down, like, uh, you know, little gems to pass down to my children, because I do have a couple of pieces of jewelry from my mom or my grandmother or I have purses of theirs. I have handbags from them. I have like one or two cashmere sweaters or something like that. Just these these things that I treasure that I knew that she wore and carried. And uh, and to me, my my grandparents and my mom are very, were very um, elegant and um, t- timeless to me, the way I saw how they dressed. Yeah. And uh, and and like Tom Ford said, they they always dressed in a way that did demonstrate good manners, right? Yes, yes, yes. I, there's a certain um, level of class, and there's a certain level of taste, and I think it's um, it comes very effortlessly, right? Again, it's very authentic, and it's not meant to be something that's forced. Um, but I think one of the things about Sunrev that is really uh, important to us as a brand, you know, even though we're, we're, we're quite focused on empowerment and um, we're very activist from that perspective, we also focus on the whimsy and the fun and the witty. And um, that's why, you know, we have many colors and there, there are a lot of things that we want to introduce that look, it's also not so heavy and serious either, you know, because at the end of the day, fashion, there's there's something spontaneous and fun about that too, right? And so it's it, so much about Sunrev is combining things that are polar opposites, right? And we talk about dichotomies coexisting and that's what, it's hard to do that, you know, because they're naturally opposing forces. Um, But we're always kind of debating and discussing, like how do we incorporate this element of fun and this element of, um, you know, just kind of small sparkle or joy in your life, right? Especially during a time that, is kind of depressing with all that's happened um, in the past year. You know, how do we brighten things up? Um, but on that foundational level of, you know, timeless elegance as well. Um, so it's it's a lot of things, you know, trying to be combined together, which is uh, definitely the challenge that we've created for ourselves. Yeah, I'm really happy that fashion is taking this um, this turn right now to re-wearing things too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, having things last. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, um, you know, with our products, I think what's really uh, powerful as a statement that we've put out is we've always said that we provide a lifetime warranty. Um, we really focus on making sure that it's, you know, an extremely high level of quality. And to your point, it's it's usable um, and it's seasonless and it goes with many different types of outfits. You could dress it up and down. Um, and so you don't always have to be swapping out bags and things like that. Um, and of course, uh, one of the iconic elements of our bag is you could wear it in multiple ways, right? Whether it's as a belt bag or as a sling or as a crossbody. Um, so all of our bags have 
you know, many different ways you can wear it um, depending on the occasion or, or however you feel comfortable. Yeah. Awesome. So I'm trying to think if there's any other questions. I can try to read down down here. I can try. Um, <laughs> but, uh, let me see. Well, think, which one which one is your favorite bag right now? I I like the um, belt bag. Yeah, um, yeah. I like the many ways that I can wear it. Yeah, you can take you can take the strap off and carry it as a clutch. Exactly. But, but I'm all about kind of hands free. Um, I mean, I'll strap that thing on and go rollerblading with my daughter. <laughs> you know? uh, I love that. I've definitely taken it on a hike as well. And um, yeah, there's so many different things, uh, you know. My doctor bag was my gateway bag. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, that was when we launched, right? Because you were one of the early people. Um, we only launched with two styles. We didn't have the belt bag in the very, very beginning. So yes, the that blush doctor bag is is quite iconic. Um yeah, I think one of the other questions was uh, you know, did anything funny happen at the start of Sunrev? Oh, um, so what one funny thing well well there's so many funny things between the two of us right maybe maybe i could just share a few funny things so one funny thing that i think people don't know is you and i met through megan right <laughs> did we yeah yeah well megan and my husband met okay pre uh harry and uh and then and then and then somehow we inherited that friendship okay because um because there was a my husband is an investor and there was this app called donna that he was working on and so um at the end and it's like a virtual assistant app and so um so that's how he and you met and then and then you and i met because uh we were, I don't know how we got into this, but we got into a deep conversation about motherhood that really struck me because at that time I just had a baby. Um, and you were, you, I remember you were sharing how, you know, motherhood changed you and, um, you know, kind of affected how you had to think about your career in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And like some of the sacrifices, you know, that, that had to happen. It is a hard balance. It's it's always a hard balance. I mean, I, I don't think there's any anybody who doesn't struggle with the work life balance. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I wouldn't even call it a balance. It's just like a plate spin. <laughs> <laughs> plate spin. Or or so. we we call it an integration. The work life integration, right? Yeah. Which is always amazing to me that you you know you brought your girls to Toronto and you figure out like schooling for them and then. You know, I mean, it's 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 quite amazing to keep all the plates spinning. <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, and the that I definitely did not do alone. I mean, it so so much of what made that work was Santu. Mm -hmm. um, and my husband also works in finance, but he really, really parents. Yes. Um, and yeah. share that, and that was not you know something that he was not open to you know he was he was on board for that and he made a lot of career sacrifices too i would say it's you know it's a tie it wasn't with us it wasn't one person sacrificing career yeah it's so important it's so important i, I agree and it's also it's important to have a partner right like a true partnership and being supportive of each other's uh, career ambitions and kind of taking on the load of family and, and children. Um, yeah, I think that's super critical to have that support system. It's really hard to do it if, to your point, right, if, if there is resistance or there is conflict around like, oh, it's whose turn is it to sacrifice now? <laughs> right, that, right. Yeah. And sometimes it's just like, we're both, you know, it's two o'clock. Uh, are, are you picking up or am I picking up? I, I'm kind of like right in the middle of something, you know, like it's just a quick negotiation right on the yes. bye. Um, but yeah, we're definitely in it together. Um, 
Yeah, for sure. Um, and then the other funny story that I was just going to share was, um, this is just like, you know, kismet, right? But like, do you remember when we had that pop up in New York City? And it was so it was you just like walked in. And I was like, wow, did you know I was going to be here? And well, why was I? I can't remember even why I was in New York. We just yeah, right. and because you were <laughs> stores, five story, um, on the Upper yeah. West Side, yeah, the East yeah. Side, and East. I popped. I just popped in to look because I was nearby, and I always have had to pop in to look in there. And we actually got some of the suits clothes from there, um, right? And they were famously amazing at helping you put together a, an outfit. Yeah. Uh, but then there you were from San Francisco and I was in from San Francisco for the chances. <laughs> it was what are the chances, right? So um that that was great. I love it when spontaneous um good things happen like that. So those are those are some really fun memories and very fond memories. Um and it's it's crazy because you know, I think one of the um things with the pandemic that makes it really hard is like there's so there's fewer kind of opportunities for spontaneous yeah and you know it's really like yes the virtual thing i think is great but there's you have to plan everything and it's like everything has to be planned in advance and um you know it's it you can't really do that organic type of thing uh, nowadays i know but hopefully everyone's going to get vaccinated and things will calm down soon. I'm very optimistic. I'm definitely an optimist, so. <laughs> glass half, be a glass half full. Yes. Well, yeah. I'm just thinking before we wrap up, if there's anything else that you want the gang that's tuning in to know about the brand. Like, did we cover it? Does anybody have any more questions? I'm seeing I, a little while ago when we were having the series part of our conversation, somebody wrote in all caps and I could see it. Um, because I can't always see all of this, but they were like, preach coral. <laughs> really nice. I know, I know. I mean, honestly, I think there's sadly so many more stories where that one came from. Um, but like I said, I tried to not let the negativity bog me down. Um, and I, and you know, one of the things that I realized from the very beginning was I kind of embraced that it wasn't going to be like without pretty serious challenges or things that uh, I'd have to overcome or maybe I'd have to prove and it wasn't fair. You know, I had to prove it because I'm a woman starting a company that's female oriented products um, and I would have to create more context so that, you know, male investors or partners or what have you can better understand it. Uh, and it's just a hurdle that, uh, you know, it, it has to be overcome. And I think as things evolve and there's more and more success, um, you know, it's it's uh, it's important to create more support. Right. And I think that's what's wonderful about um, women today. I think uh, we've had and I personally have had tremendous friends and mentors be so supportive um, and always advocating and, um, you know, and I think for SunRev, we're also as a brand really supportive and open to supporting other female founded brands or BIPOC founded brands. We um, actually during the height of the pandemic last year launched a program called Selected by SunRev where we feature a lot of different um, young brands that the, our, our team really loves and curates uh, that are female founded or BIPOC owned. Um, and so that's a really um, creative initiative that we came up with to use our platform for good and um, to uh, be supportive. Um, and so we're always thinking about it that way. You know, I think to me, uh, more women and more female entrepreneurs, executives, um, leaders in whatever field that they're in, I think that's a wonderful thing. You know, I, I don't see it as competition. I don't see it as negative in any way. Oh, no, no. And it's really important that we all support each other. Oh, yes, absolutely. Great coral! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I saw someone ask, um, which what which bag would Donna like the most? Is it and is it different from Sarah? Um, well, 
Donna like? Donna. I wonder if Donna would rock. <laughs> Actually, I don't know if that, I was thinking the backpack. What's the one that's the backpack? Oh, the Maestra, yeah. Um, I could see that, I could see that. I, mean, I think she'd have to carry it. She'd carry it. In, As a top handle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, with like a really, like a really. The, uh, is it the Aluna that's new? Yeah. Sometimes yeah. that gives me like a little bit of um, Kelly, Kelly bag, uh, inspo i don't know yeah. why but, i can uh, see donna with the aluna um again you know the, the donna is like she was never really like lugging all her stuff in. no no somebody had to somebody sherpered her things back and forth to the office <laughs> outfit changes yeah. you know her, her suits had not a single wrinkle <laughs> yes yeah, so she must have been like laying in the back of the car Every day, you know, Gina. Um, Gina has many of Gina's clothes. I mean, I, I remember it this way. She might remember it differently, but a lot of them were made for her, were custom, mm. and um, and in those silk fabrics. So she needed. Um, you know, we were on set, we were on set for a really long, long, yeah, time. yeah, and um, you know, for it could be fourteen hours or something like that. So right, she right, it when we were shooting she didn't want to sit we had so much reverence for the costume what the wardrobe team yeah. they didn't want to mess with their work so right the carpenters built <laughs> gina this um board which was very long because she's very tall to <laughs> lean on so she could <laughs> lean because you do have to rest yes she wouldn't mess up her outfit oh my gosh <laughs> Did sure. she did she take off her high heels though? At least we always <laughs> took off our he high heels and yeah. most frequently. And Gina was great because she actually had some device that she like worked her feet out on um, in between takes, which was really smart because you do actually need to help your feet rebound from being in those things. But we would take off depending on where the camera was. We would be you know in UGGs underneath you know yeah. uh, I, out of the frame. Yeah, that that makes sense. I mean, for fourteen hours a day, that's really tough to be in like a perfect platform because sometimes, it's yeah. like, oh, if it's a fifty, if we're both in this shot, I'm suddenly going to be much shorter. So we were <laughs> like sketchers. Well, also, Gina's really, really tall. Yeah, she is. And I remember whenever I would have a walk and talk with her, where you're like walking and shooting a scene, and they shoot it in a one, I was always like trying to keep up because. <laughs> I'm not I'm short, but I'm sort of long. <laughs> my height is in my body, not in my legs. Yeah, interesting. And so I was just like, I can barely take these strides. Like, I have to really get my arms going to keep up. Uh, oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, so, oh, yeah, I just saw in one of the comments um, a reminder is that, you know, we actually just launched um, some other products outside of the handbag category, including, like, really comfy loungewear, cashmere, silks, and we launched these amazing um, shearling slippers um, and actually just released the sandal version for spring and summer. So those 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 are really comfy and um, they're just like oh, a beautiful like cushion for your feet, but also still really cute. Um, but yeah, I haven't uh, and I'm petite, right? So I always wear heels, but I really haven't worn heels at all in this past year, which is kind of kind of crazy. I mean, it's really the first time in my life where, uh, you know, I haven't I haven't worn four or five inch heels on a day like this. <laughs> did you kick the, Did you kick them off under your desk? <laughs> or did you keep them? I was a dancer as a kid, and so my feet have tremendous pain tolerance, and I have a very high arch, so it just, you know, I could tolerate it, but I probably can't, you know, anymore <laughs> since after you take a one-year hiatus, it's hard to go back. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like um, it's really, it's so interesting um, how life will be permanently changed you know going through um going through what we've gone through in the world um and so i think in the next couple of years uh it, it'll be really just interesting to see um but again i'm really optimistic you, you know feel like fashion will will always have this loungy 
in the next few years, we'll have this loungy, comfortable element that remains, or will, when we get out of this, will everybody just be dolling it up as like a, a pendulum swing away from it? What's your, what's your, what's your bet on that? And then we can like circle back in a year and a half or two years and see how you did. <laughs> Uh, I, I love that. Okay, so I am a student of history, right? And so I do look at, hey, when, um, like 100 years ago, when a pandemic like this hit, what happened after, right? And I would say that it became, you know, fashion became extremely um, uh, extravagant and, uh, you know, just it was decadent it, because people were so... Um, repressed for a long time and i think what's interesting in terms of the just the trends that we're seeing in our community uh you know uh there are a lot of people who are starting to do domestic travel because they've been vaccinated and they feel comfortable and so we see a lot more people buying our larger bags like the maestro collection um the maestro or the midi maestra they're also preparing to potentially go back into the office or start doing some business travel um so we're already seeing that shift um happen and i think uh it'll happen throughout the summer um but yeah i do believe that uh you know fashion will be um will will be kind of this uh uh you know it's it's a way for you to express some of these pent up feelings you know so i do believe uh that it's going to you know it can still be comfortable right there's no knock against being comfortable and you know for Sen rev we're always about that practicality and comfort combined with the extra um, but I do think that fashion is going to have a really big moment in the next couple of years because um, people are really pent up. You know, they want occasions to get dressed up. They want to um, have that feeling of self-expression and freedom, you know, and, and uh, fashion is a great way to be able to express that. So do you think that the, the in terms of fashion weeks, that there will be as many seasons as there were before? Do you think that the huge luxury brands will be doing the shows, the couture, the ready to wear, the all of it? For all so the seasons? I think that is a really um, interesting question where I feel like that model actually has been evolving over time and even before the pandemic it really was no longer um it was quite antiquated you know so for us for senrev we don't follow the fashion calendar we release new products or style kind of on a monthly basis you know we have new colors um we always have some interesting newness that we can share with the community and um, we can engage on um and the the that um pre-release kind of seasonal model is so antiquated because it's really much more about buy now, use now, wear now. Um, you know, it's really strange to release a big fashion show in the fall for like spring, summer and resort, you know, and um, I think that is really going to go away. Um, but are there going to be, you know, beautiful events and um, really amazing celebrations of fashion? I think that will continue just in a slightly different format. Yeah. I need to get back to Paris. To oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, I have to go back to Italy. I, I really miss it so much. And, uh, you know, Florence it, it, over the years has really become like a, like a, you know, I feel like being at home when I when I um, see the Duomo and I you know it's a it's an amazing place and it's so inspiring and I do feel like uh, uh, it's hard to maintain that connection you know when you're not physically immersed uh, and of course I miss all the food and the wine and you know well, I've been um, with the family Tucci show that uh, yes yes or whatever it's called. Oh. Yeah, it's so decadent. Yes, yes, so yeah. It's just like any anything that has like a travel element for me, I've been watching. Even, even oh my gosh, oh, I binged my face off on a not new show just last week, uh, Broadchurch, which oh. is really dark. Um, incredible acting, amazing acting, as everybody knows, because everybody's seen it before me. Um, I think they were done with it in 2017, but... Um, you know, it's like a coastal town in 
England. So anything that's in a different place. Well, I, I'm still I'm still on Bridgerton. I've rewatched it several times. Um, a little trip in time. Bridgerton's like a trip back in time. And yes. like, I yes. loved Normal People. Normal People is one of my favorite things that I watched during the pandemic. But but because of the acting and the story, and I loved the book. And um, but also just the location, just being in Ireland. Yeah, it's actually watching something that takes place in in that place. It, you know, they figure the location figures so prominently and thing so yeah i think i think it'll be wonderful um to be able to have those immersive experiences again um and yeah i think uh fashion is an enabler of that too you know um it's it you get excited about like hey when you go to paris next you know what what accessories are you going to bring or what are you going to wear it's part of the whole thrill um and i think yeah i can't wait for that um, and I think many people can't wait for that to happen again. And just to to wrap it up, because I know I've kept you here longer than an hour. <laughs> yeah, it's been so fun to catch up. And yeah, what are, what are you reading? Actually, there was a question on what are you both reading right now? Oh, I actually let me get the book that I'm reading. It's really interesting. Don't look at my sweatpants. <laughs> <laughs> you got up so fast. I didn't see it. I swear. Um, I'm gonna crawl. I'm gonna crawl back so we can't see. My <laughs> Um, I'm reading this book, Let's Talk About Death Over Din Dinner by Michael Hebb, um, oh, who so I had the pleasure of meeting uh, through a very dear friend. And it is a, it's a really interesting book. He's created a movement about talking about death while we're still alive. And it sounds really dark and it is, but it's an important topic and a hard thing to face. Mm, that's what do you think? That's so interesting. I'm <laughs> so I'm I'm technically oh I'm having a lot of trouble with this book. I'll I'll show you. It's big. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm, oh. Reading, I'm reading Kissinger's autobiography on his four, first four years in the White House. I am a history buff and a total nerd. Um, but I have to say that I've been having trouble with this one. It is so dense and so detailed. Um, but it's an amazing um, kind of history lesson of, you know, another time in American history where there was so much um, angst, right? It was, you know, the Vietnam War. I mean, there were so many things happening um, that obviously I didn't live through, and and it's fascinating um, to read it. And he also goes into European history. He was a professor before, so he's quite uh, he's quite verbose and prolific, hence the, this is just volume one of two. <laughs> um, so I'm about a fourth of the way there, but it's quite a, it's quite a dense book. I don't know if I would recommend it to uh, the faint of heart, but um, I do love um, Walter Isaacson, who writes amazing biographies. Um, the Steve Jobs biography is incredible. Um, and if you haven't read it, one of the books that really inspired me to be an entrepreneur is um, Shoe Dog. By um, Santu loved that book. Loved so that book. It's a classic. And it's just, uh, you know, there are so many hardships that he went through ups and downs and and really you know there was a moment in time when he was selling shoes out of the back of his truck and the only person who would buy it was his mom <laughs> and it just you know it really reminds me of like wow um you know in a short amount of time sun Rev has accomplished so much right and even though we've had a ton of challenges it's nothing like you know what phil knight had to go through to get nike off the ground and so um that one's particularly inspiring for me Amazing. Amazing. Well, we should do this again someday. Yes, this is really <laughs> fun. And thanks to everyone for the great questions and so much engagement. And um, yeah, I do want to say thank you to everybody who commented yesterday and who tuned in today and just look, these are our, our these are our connections right now during the pandemic. So <laughs> I really just want to say thank you. I do. I read your comments. I I see them and they fill me up. and uh, And I and I deeply appreciate this community here on Instagram and um, and the interactions that I get to have with with all of you and with you, Coral. And yeah, so thank you so much. And I'm excited. We'll get back on here and one day soon and talk about 
all more things that you're working on the launch of a bag you i know you do uh you have philanthropic endeavors through the brand um we should catch up more about sustainability this summer or or you know this fall definitely get, get an update on what was going on i hope i didn't spill beans too much but maybe it was just a teaser for what's to come in terms of um op vegan options and sustainable options so thank you for you know showing showing the way uh to like making choices for luxury that are sustainable so because we can all kind of vote with our pocketbooks in that way by choosing you know sustainable brands to support um and to turn our friends on to i have friends who have become also become lovers of Senrab and part of the Octopi community, as I like to say. So yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It was so great to see you. I'll talk to you soon. And thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.